thanks for walking us through the method step by step for a student or um, somebody new to doing the phenomenological method in psychology. What are the points in the method where people sometimes get stuck or get lost or confused? Uh, what are the sort of roadblocks to watch out for? Well, <clears throat> first of all, you have to have a background in phenomenology, at least a minimum. If there's no background, you can't do the method, simply, okay? So the hardest steps then are uh, analyzing the description from within the reduction. That you have to be sure that you don't bring in your background and you don't bring in things you already know so that you might read something, oh, that reminds me, you know, of associationistic theory. Well, you can't bring that in. You've got to come up with new information strictly based on what you're reading, but from a psychological perspective. Now, that's a real big problem because I would say the definition of psychology in the correct sense is still not a, a, an historical achievement. We have viewpoints like psychoanalytic, behavioristic, cognitive, but those can't get together and come up with one definition of psychology. And the phenomenological is a perspective too. But at least we try to say, this is our meaning of psychology and this is what I'm trying to articulate. But I articulate it with the sense that this will be an agreeable definition of psychology for all people. Probably it won't be, so it'll be criticized, but at least that's what you shoot for, okay? So getting there, too, is difficult. What? How can I describe a psychological finding so that psychoanalysts, behaviorists, and cognitivists would not complain? I, I don't think you can do it in our day and age, but that's the long-range achievement, that when we get together and really come up with the genuine essence of psychology, then you can do that. But at the moment, you do the best you can. So that's one big stumbling block that when I give workshops or gave workshops on phenomenological method, a lot of time was spent after I gave the students a description to analyze to talk about the transformations. And I go to each student, what did you do? What did you say? And then I would see presuppositions in there. I would see viewpoints. I would see other, it wouldn't be like a pure description. So that's a real big step. Then, <clears throat> Once you get past that, the other difficulty is the structure. How do you come from all these many manifestations of the phenomenon to boiling it down to its essence? And this takes a certain unique talent, which maybe not everybody has. <clears throat> like if I asked you, oh, did you go to movies last night? What was the picture about? You'll probably give me an essential description. Oh, it was a detective story about a murderer, you know. That would be a quick essence, right, of it. Then I ask you, how did you get that? Most people can't answer. <laughs> they say, well, I, I saw the movie and that's what I think it was about. Well, that's what you have to do with the data. You have to come up with something that captures all the genuine variations but leaves out the non-genuine variation because an empirical description will have more variations than the essential ones. So you have to tease out what is essential and then boil it down to quick expression. That takes a lot of time. Usually a whole session goes to coming up with the structure. I have each student give me the structure, then everybody criticizes it, talks about it, we try to make it better. So I would say those are two, the two talents, and note, they're all intuitive. You know, for Husserl, intuition means perception, seeing what is there, and describing it carefully. So the whole method depends upon intuition, my ability to intuit what is psychological, my ability to reduce the psychological to its pure essence, and I've got to do it all myself. And I would say that is a talent that is not even spoken to in contemporary psychology, let alone trained and developed. So that's a real big stumbling block.
in learning the method. What's the connection between phenomenology and humanistic psychology? What makes your method humanistic? Well, <clears throat> if I remained a pure phenomenologist and I wanted to get together with all the phenomenologists in America, I could probably meet, well, not in the phone booth, but close to it. So the phenomenological frame of reference while I work within it and, you know, really believe in it, there's so few people that share that in a correct way, there's a lot of phenomenology used incorrectly, that <clears throat> I was looking for a broader framework. And at the time, late 50s, early 60s, humanistic psychology was being developed by Maslow, Rogers, uh, Bud Kahn was part of it. So I thought, well, that's a good framework. I can fit within it. They do other things in phenomenology within that framework, and that's okay, but I think phenomenology could easily fit within it because, <clears throat> as my first book says, I wanted psychology as a human science, not the natural science. And I thought <clears throat> that was the best term to use because if you look at all the activities that human can do, you'll find some are non-naturalistic like cultural phenomena, making art, reading poetry, philosophizing about certain wisdoms, you know, all of those were not really naturalistic and the basis was activities of consciousness. So I thought, well, no one would deny, you know, that there's a certain peculiarity to human consciousness. So I would fit comfortable within the humanistic framework and so psychology as a human science would be a step to broadening it outside of naturalism because we're more than natural, at least according to certain philosophies, uh, other philosophies would reduce humans to natural, of course, but I would argue against that. So <clears throat> because the humanistic psychology was blossoming, and don't forget this is the 60s, in the 60s America was transforming itself in all sorts of ways. So I thought maybe we could ride the crest of these changes and maybe being humanistic as a phenomenologist might make it more amenable to more people than being strictly phenomenological. So that's why I joined the humanistic movement and why I argue for a humanistic perspective for psychology but humanistic as a term was broader than phenomenology. But that's okay, the, you know, as long as it could be included faithfully, and I think it could. So I've argued then for human science, which was a humanistic principle. Um, and that's how I thought phenomenology could fit in with humanistic psychology. How do the philosophical foundations of the phenomenological method differ from those of other qualitative methods? Um, maybe, for instance, uh, grounded theory or discourse analysis? Well, of course, it's because it's grounded in phenomenology as a philosophy. And I'm not aware, well, there are a few others. I mean, IPA claims to do it but I don't think it does. And von Manen claims to be based on phenomenology. I think he's you know, closer to the truth, but he has certain Heideggerian influences that would at least not be Husserlian. So there's another distinction. <clears throat> I'm Husserlian phenomenology, and von Manen is more Heideggerian. And my former student, Kalesi, was also more Heideggerian. Uh, so, there are legitimate Heideggerian ways of doing it, but it wouldn't be the, the same as Husserl. But once you leave <clears throat> the phenomenological framework, then <clears throat> all the others, I would say, like uh, grounded theory, 
is based on empiricism, uh, even quasi-positivism, uh, depending if you follow Strauss or the other guy, I forget his name. With age, I forget proper names more. Um, and of course, there are interpretive theories, and they were not Husserlian, they could be Heideggerian, or they could be independent of phenomenology. But I am a descriptivist, and <clears throat> my reason is, I think description is more rigorous than interpretation. Not that you can't do interpretation. I, I admit you can do good interpretive research, but there's a difference in the claims. With description, there comes a strong claim, this is the way things are. I'm describing what I see, and I'm saying, this is how it is. Now you can critique me, but you have to come up with counter evidence. With interpretation, you say, well, what I'm dealing with is somewhat ambiguous, but here's how I interpret it. But I admit it's not the only interpretation. There could be other interpretations. So it gets a bit weaker because you're picking one interpretation, but then one could say, how do you justify that? Why are you picking that interpretation and not another? Now, sometimes people do that, but often they don't. They just say, well, that's my interpretation. Well, you can't dispute that. You can make an interpretation and you can go ahead and make your, you know, uh, develop your theory, but why that interpretation, not another? So that leaves more questions than the descriptivist. But a second point is, you know, all interpretation theories say, in order to interpret, you have to have a given that's ambiguous, at least. Uh, it's not clear, it's ambiguous in some way. So that invites interpretation. I agree, that's, that's what happens. But as a descriptivist, I can say, you know, I find the given to be ambiguous. Here's how it is ambiguous for me. A, B, C. So you can articulate the very ambiguity. And if you like, you might then say, well, of those three ambiguities, I think C is more likely to be the real event. So now I will describe based on that C interpretation. So even when the phenomenon is ambiguous, which is the starting point of interpretation, you can deal with it descriptively. But if something's very clear, it's harder to interpret. You, if you're interpretive, you have to say, well, I don't need interpretation. I can tell you that's the way it is. So I find strength in the descriptive approach of, over the others, although you can do the others. And I might even claim there are times maybe you really have to interpret, okay then you do it. But I would say there's a certain loss in doing that over not being able to describe. So that's why I'm a descriptivist. <clears throat> so I was talking to Fred Wirtz recently, and he said that in doing the detailed historical work you have on the field, that you've often discovered little, or you've discovered like undervalued people in the history of psychology and philosophy who have a lot to contribute, but maybe don't make it into the history book. Uh, I wonder if you could talk about a few of those those people that you've discovered in your... Well, uh, sure, Husserl being one. I mean, he's certainly known in philosophy, but the psychologists that deal with him is, are few. Merleau-Ponty would be another. <clears throat> I often thought of a book, Mer uh, Psychology After Merleau-Ponty, meaning literally after he has spoken, what would it look like? It is really radically transformed. But that was such a huge effort. <laughs> you know, when I taught at Saybrook, I taught there 27 years, there's no sabbatical, even summers. So I didn't get time for myself, and it was a student-driven tuition place, so you got a lot of students always dealing with them. So you really were very, very busy. So I often got time to write articles or give speeches, but I couldn't get into books so much, so that's why that book never got written, but I had it in the back of my mind for a long time. So Merleau-Ponty, you know, would be another, but 
There's another, even someone like Bain de Buran. Bain de Buran was a French thinker who wrote about the body a lot. And a contemporary phenomenologist, Michel Henri, wrote a whole book on the body as interpreted by Bain de Buran, although he didn't go along with them all the way, but he started a tradition that he thought phenomenologists could develop further. So he'd be another guy, Maine de Baran. Um, I would say Dilthai is underdiscovered. Huh? Everybody knows about him, but nobody situates himself in Dilthai's work and then develops it. You know, it's just covered uh, rather quickly. Um, if I would, you know, that was early in my career. I would have other names if, uh, if I were closer to my youth. Uh, but I kept coming across names like that that I thought were important for psychology, but, you know, were not developed. You know, they're fads and fashions in science as much as in culture. So those fads and, oh yeah, another one is the Würzburg School. Uh, I mentioned that to you earlier. Between 1900 and 1910, they did consciousness studies and they used an enlarged introspective method. Wundt was so unhappy he wrote an article criticizing them that they didn't use the method the way he said it should be used. But they came up with the idea that not all consciousness is awareness, so there are unconscious factors when you experience independently of Freud. Uh, <clears throat> they came up with the idea of a determining tendency, that somehow they would give them a task, and then you would set that task, then forget about it. But the task was determining everything you did, even though you were not aware of it. Then they came up with the really controversial finding, imageless thought. They described that sometimes they had awarenesses that had no sensory basis. And you know, talked about Bewusstseinslager, you know, something like consciousness, content, they couldn't describe any other way, so it ultimately came out as imageless thought. And I still think that if we really examined the Würzburg School, it would have been a chance for a different development of psychology. But it went from 1900 to 1910, 1912 behaviorism came in. And everybody then jumped on to behaviorism, in part because Wundt criticized their method, but they defended it too. And it looked like introspection, so they didn't want any more introspection. And so everybody went behaviorism, and then from behaviorism they went neuro. So that's what is carrying psychology today. But if you situate yourself in the Würzburg school, I would say a wholly different tradition could have emerged. So that's another case. I did my senior paper in college on the Würzburg School. And here's a funny historical. Carl Bueller, the husband of Charlotte Bueller, who was very big in the humanistic movement. Carl Bueller came from Germany to the States after the war. And there was a rumor that Fordham was going to hire him. And that was 1952. I started in September 53. If they had hired Bueller, I would have worked on thinking. I told you during lunch that my mentor said, well, I think you work on what you like after you're well established. And so he dismissed that. And so I worked on vision and psychophysics. But if Bueller had been there, I would have been a Würzburg scholar. So there's a rook one of those missed opportunities in history. All right, I know you're currently working on another book. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what you're working on and where you think the field is headed? Well, I can't speak for the field. <laughs> I'll speak for the phenomenology within the field. Mm. Yeah, I, I have... I have two books I was work I was working on one book which I called Consciousness and the Discipline of Psychology. 
And <clears throat> there I'm going into how did psychologists understand consciousness when the field began? So I go back to late 19th century, early 20th century. And you'd be surprised at the befuddlement that is there, how consciousness was understood, not understood, uh, and uh, a lot of it came from the, what they call the medical psychology of the French, you know, um, The people Freud studied with, uh, they'll come, the name, again, proper names are slow in coming to me these days, uh, given my age. Uh, the French famous, say, Charcot was one, and Bernheim, I think, was the other, two schools, because they dealt with people, they used hypnosis to try, try to deal with people that had all kinds of problems. And often what came up is in addition, they said the problem was with consciousness, but there are all kinds of bodily manifestations. So what was the relation between the body and consciousness? So that's one whole big thing. Then you had Freud and psychoanalysis. And Betelheim wrote a little book on Freud that said, you have to interpret him as a human scientist, not a natural scientist, you know, but nobody does because of the way the Strachys translated him into English. But then he says what Freud did is he used introspection on the other. That's basically his method. So he too struggled with what is consciousness. He made certain distinctions but didn't have a clear... He said, you know, when you detail consciousness, you know, it gives us memory or it gives us perceptions, it's easy. But try to stay what it is in general, that's hard. And it's very funny because he attended Brentano's lectures and Brentano did come up. Brentano says Inten um, the essence of consciousness is intentionality. It's being directed to an object. So maybe Freud missed that class. But anyway, Brentano gave him that answer, at least Brentano's answer. But Freud didn't, but he did bring in a lot of unconscious which was a mode of consciousness. So that extended consciousness even more. Then you had James and all his flirtation with spiritual phenomena. You know, so there's all kinds of books showing how James really dealt into it seriously. You know, he was not a, just playing with it. He was seriously trying to say, how can we understand all these spiritual phenomena and all these other psychic phenomena that he got involved in. So, what was their understanding of consciousness? So, I'm showing that, you know, then you go into Brentano, Dilthai, and Husserl, and they're all slightly different ways of understanding. But then I bring in behaviorism and psychophysical parallelism again, where they avoid the issue. And I even go up to some of the contemporary work where there's a few books I have, you know, theories of consciousness, and consciousness is not mentioned at all. It's all physiological. You know, they all go under. So I want to show how we're avoiding the topic. No wonder we're not increasing our knowledge of it. I go into introspection a bit, into Titchener's work, and uh, I go into Boring's and Danzinger's history of introspection, the way they covered it. But what is interesting, they don't go into detail into Brentano. And Brentano was the founder of the ACT School of Psychology, which included Stumpf and a few other Germans, but then that died. In part, it died because nobody knew how to follow it, because they stayed within consciousness as intentional, and that dropped out. Everybody went with the experiments and the introspection approach to consciousness. So, it's a very muddied history, okay? Anyway, that's what I was working on. So I'm starting to write a book to answer Zahavi, which um, I forget the tentative title I had on it. Oh yeah, and here I thought it was the time to really go into the, the main issue, and I call it a non-naturalistic method for psychology.
based on Husserl, which is not naturalistic. I made it psychological. And I'm claiming that to understand consciousness properly, you have to be non-naturalistic. Naturalistic leads you to behaviorism and psychophysical parallelism. But to stay with consciousness, and I think if you look at the history of psychology, the way it's all so neurological, and if you look at the Journal of Consciousness Studies, it's mostly philosophers talking there, not psychologists. Occasionally psychologists but often it gets still neurological and physiological. So that book then is a critique that unless we get non-naturalistic, psychology will not grow as a science. So those are the two books that I'm working on now.